We are really happy to welcome today Piotr Dvorak from Northwestern University. So Piotr has a substantial contributions on mechanism design and information design and is going to present today a paper entitled Redistributive uh, Allocative Allocation Mechanisms. Sorry. We also have the pleasure to welcome Daniel Garrett from Toulouse School of Economics as a discussant. As you know, Daniel has substantial contribution on micro theory. Thanks a lot, uh, Piotr and Daniel, for, for being with us today. A uh, few words to before to start to quickly remind the rules and procedure of the seminar. So Piotr, we make some breaks at some relevant moments. And during this, these breaks, you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, the good thing is also that um, Scott Cominus, which is co-author of this paper, is also with us. So if you want, you can also ask your question in the chat and, and, and uh, Scott uh, will reply. Um, I also remind you that the talk is recorded. So if you don't want to be in the video, it's very easy. Just don't ask, don't ask questions, we'll not be on it. Just ask your questions through the chat and, uh, and either we'll ask a question directly to Piotr or Scott will, will reply directly. Okay, if you don't have a stable connection, uh, I will also put in a few minutes in the chat uh, a link for the slide that you could download. Uh, I think it, that's all for me. And uh, so Piotr, Daniel, thanks again for being with us. And Piotr, the, the screen is yours. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, this is joint work, by the way, with so Mohamed Agbapur uh, and Scott, who's, who's here, who has been introduced. So thanks, Scott, for being here. Um, okay, so uh, starting observation that many goods and services are allocated using non-market mechanisms. Okay, and, and, and there are really lots of examples. Um, even though monetary transfers are feasible and in fact, sometimes used kind of in, in parallel. So think about housing, for example. Of course, there is uh, primarily a private housing market where you can buy or rent houses. But there are also in many cities, in many countries around the world, public housing programs where houses are being allocated either for free or at very reduced um, below market prices. Okay. And the list goes on. So, you know, in Europe, of course, healthcare is mostly provided in some sort of public system for free or at discounted prices. Food stamps in the US could be, could be an, an example, road access, school seats, park permits, and so on. And I, I don't want to mention the vaccines, of course. Uh, in most countries, as far as I know, vaccines are being allocated effectively for free, even though it wouldn't be too hard to imagine we could um, use prices. And some economists have been arguing actually in favor of prices. I do want to uh, say here, we are actually working on a paper about this vaccine allocation that applies the framework of the paper I'm presenting now, specifically to vaccines. So today's talk will not be targeted uh, at that topic, but uh, just uh, to advertise a little bit. Okay, and this is a little bit puzzling to economists, maybe not too much, but the usual argument we would use as economists is why not use a market mechanism when we know it is sufficient, right? We know uh, from the first welfare theorem or just basic mechanisms and analysis that we could achieve efficiency if we used uh, a market outcome or market mechanism. And one answer that you could potentially give, and I believe many policymakers would basically say this is the reason, is that we don't just care about maximizing the pie, we also care about the split. We have redistributive concerns. That could be one reason for using non-market mechanisms. And so this is the goal of this paper is to basically provide a market design framework for thinking about optimal allocation and the redistributive concerns. Okay. Now for this seminar, market design seminar, I don't have to explain, I guess, what the market design approach is, but I do wanna say that this is sort of in contrast to public finance, right? So we assume that the designer just allocates this, those objects in the single market. So she only controls the allocation in that market without having access, or at least without considering the interaction with other sort of conventional tools for a distribution like income taxation or, or the domain of public finance. Okay, so that's, that's what we mean by a, a market design perspective. So a bit more specifically about the model, we're going to have a designer that just allocates a fixed set of goods of heterogeneous quality uh, to agents differing in both their observed and unobserved characteristics. So this interplay of observed and unobserved will be the, the key emphasis here. And we're just gonna derive the optimal mechanism under incentive compatibility, individual rationality constraints. And really the main um, innovation in some sense, although it's a, it's a fairly straightforward innovation, is that we're going to have a welfare function uh, with welfare weights. Okay, that will be the, the main emphasis. And we'll show roughly speaking, it's not really a preview of results, but just the factor that will be important here, uh, that the optimal mechanism is shaped by interactions between um, social preferences and observability of agents characteristics. So effectively, there'll be some underlying social preferences um, 
but the designer will not necessarily observe who's the most deserving and she'll have to decide on the uh, based on some sort of observability that we're going to assume and perhaps based on information elicited in the mechanism. Second, we're going to show how important it is to think about revenue. Okay, and so we're going to think about revenue as yet another source of redistribution and this will play a key role in shaping the optimal mechanism. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll show that uh, it's also important whether the good is essential or not in a, in a way to be formalized and, and made more precise. Okay, uh, this is a short talk, so I'll only talk about th the three most closely related papers. The first one we always mention is Weizmann 77. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first uh, paper to formally point out that a random allocation can actually outperform market uh, allocation, market pricing, when the designer is not just interested in maximizing willingness to pay, but instead wants to maximize something like the total agent's need or something. Okay, so, so who is the first uh, person to point this out formally? Um, the second paper I wanna highlight is the, the one by Condorelli in 2013. Um, this is essentially a, a full mechanism design approach to Weizmann's problem. So how do, we, how do we differ from that? On a technical level, uh, we add um, some extensions that we believe are really important for this problem in practice. So we have heterogeneous quality of objects, which is gonna play a key role here. Um, slightly more important continuum of goods and agents. What's really important, we have uh, preferences over revenue, which is absent from Condorelli's analysis will be driving our results to a large extent. On a conceptual level, I would argue that Condorelli's paper is more focused on methods. We really wanna focus on kind of an applied perspective of market design. How can we connect the primitives of the model to recommendations to policymakers about market design? And finally, uh, some of you may have seen our first paper in this, in this sort of research agenda, which is a much more sort of conceptual and, and a much more um, stripped down version of this, where we kind of look at a two-sided market. This, in one sentence summary, this new paper is more like an operational take on this. We want to provide particular guidelines for policymakers when they actually allocate those objects in practice. That's why we care a lot about these extensions, real life extensions like quality, uh, observable information and some restrictions on lump sum transfers. So we're gonna see how this plays a role. Okay, maybe I should, uh, I'm gonna skip the rest of the lit review. We can always come back to discussing some papers uh, later in the discussion. In terms of methods, I'm, I just wanna highlight a few papers here uh, because they're pretty closely related in terms of the methods. I'll, I'll come back to this uh, when I talk about that. Okay, um, I may stop here for just a few seconds to see if there are questions. Great. So I'll talk about the model. I'll talk a little bit about the derivation of the optimal mechanism, but very, very briefly. What I really wanna focus on are the economic implications. Okay, so, um, okay. the model fits on two slides. It, it's extremely simple. It's just mechanism design with you know, heterogeneous quality objects plus those Pareto weights, that, that's, that'll be the main point. So we have a designer who chooses uh, a mechanism to allocate a unit mass of objects to a unit mass of agents, okay? Each object has a quality Q and we just normalize this to lie on zero one. There is some distribution of quality given by CDFF. Okay? This just describes the set of feasible objects. Agents are gonna be characterized by three dimensional types. Okay, and bear with me. I'm gonna explain later exactly what this means. Uh, for now, the three types are as follows. Uh, the dimen three dimensions of the type are label I, and this is gonna be observable to the designer. So there's everything that's sort of directly verifiable, observable about an individual, maybe their uh, gender, you know, their, their age, I don't know, their income, maybe, uh, depending on what you can observe. R is going to be what we usually would refer to as value in a standard model. We call this willingness to pay for quality, it's just a non-negative number. And finally, this key new element is the unobserved to, to the designer, social welfare weight lambda, which is also a non-negative weight. And we assume that the type distribution, okay, so the distribution of these three dimensional types is known to the designer. Okay? But of course, she does not observe the realization of willingness to pay and, and the social welfare weight. So what's the meaning of, of, of this three dimensional type? Well, if an agent with this type I R lambda gets a good with quality Q and pays T for it, we assume the utility is quasi-linear, in fact, also linear in quality. So she just gets Q R minus T. It's, this is sort of the main simplification we introduced mainly for tractability. Okay, this, this is what gives this framework so much power in terms of its tractability. So this is the individual utility level. So what's the meaning of lambda? Well, lambda determines the contribution to the social welfare function that we're going to be maximizing here. So when an individual gets utility QR minus T, 
the contribution uh, to the welfare uh, is going to be uh, lambda times that. Okay. And so effectively, uh, let me talk a little bit about those lambdas. The way we think about that is we imagine that the designer you know, hypothetically could observe everything, absolutely everything about these individuals in society, including their entire life history, their circumstances, everything. Then as a primitive of the model, she would know how much as society we value giving that particular agent a dollar. Okay, and that's, that's lambda. That's how much uh, we value giving a dollar to a particular agent. But that's unobserved. We don't observe everything about every individual. Okay, so just a hypothetical object that's in the background. That's a reflection of social preferences. Okay, and now I just have to describe feasible mechanisms and that's the end of the model, basically. So we allow for arbitrary mechanisms. So we're going to apply the revelation principle. So we're gonna look at direct allocation mechanisms where agents basically report their three-dimensional types. Uh, and then the designer allocates, so the allocation is gonna be just a lottery over quality levels. And there is a transfer that the, that the agent pays to the designer. Okay, we assume feasibility, which just means that you cannot allocate more objects than you have. We allow for free disposal. Uh, we could also look at the case without free disposal. Um, IC constraints just mean that in this direct mechanism, agents should report their type truthfully because I is observed, it's just a, this observable label. Uh, we only impose this truthfulness, truthfulness of the report on R and Lambda, okay? IR constraint just says agents want to participate. And then we impose non-negative transfers, but this is actually a feature, not a bug. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. For now, think of transfers being non-negative. It doesn't constrain what we can implement in this model because agents' uh, willingness to pay is non-negative. Uh, but we are actually gonna allow lump sum payments to the agents, but through sort of back door. So uh, I'll explain why we do it later. Okay, and what's the objective function? That's the last piece. Um, so our designer is going to maximize for some constant alpha, a weighted sum of revenue and agents utilities weighted by their operator weights or sorry, by, by the welfare weights, okay? And of course, these are unobserved things. So this, this is why there's an expectations operator here. Alpha is a constant, so that's known, okay? And that's it, that's what we wanna do. Just a clarification question. Uh, so Lambda and R are gonna be correlated. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll talk about this quite a bit okay. because that's the key point. Just, just very quick question. Um, but how does the vaccine really fit into that when I see this welfare function? Because, um, I mean, doesn't, doesn't there? Yeah, it doesn't. It okay. doesn't fit. That's why we have a separate paper that <laughs> will they'll have a slightly different model where we talk about externalities, for example, yeah. that are key, that are really important. So th this is not about vaccines. I just wanted to advertise, but we have a separate framework. Thank you for this clarification. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, I wanna comment a bit about the model. And this, in some sense, the next few slides are the gist of this talk. So I, surprisingly, I, I don't think the results are the most import, important or interesting part of this paper. I think that the next slides are the most important ideas. So to say, although they are, they are trivial mathematically, I wanna emphasize this, but I think economically, uh, we think that there is some content that's interesting. First, a, a simple lemma that even though the designer of course cares about those unobserved lambdas, she actually cannot really elicit them. And that's not surprising. Um, the formal statement is that it's without loss of optimality for the designer to only elicit information about the willingness to pay so that the allocation will only depend on the labels and willingness to pay, but not on uh, Lambda directly. The reason why this is not surprising is that Lambda doesn't affect behavior of the agents. And so you cannot really hope to elicit this in any uh, incentive compatible mechanism. In fact, you could make some agents indifferent, but we show it's uh, kind of only improves and is probably zero um, set. So it doesn't help you in terms of your objective. What it means is that we cannot use the actual lambdas. We don't know the, these lambdas and we cannot elicit them. Um, so the, the designer instead is going to use expected weights based on the things she can observe, which is I and R, okay? So we're going to define those um, expected weights, lambda I, R, which are just the expectation of the true weights based on the label I and willingness to pay R. Just to have a different term for this, we're gonna call these things Pareto weights as opposed to the the primitive lambdas, which we call uh, welfare weights, okay? Uh, we assume they are continuous just for, for simplicity. All right, and so the designer is just going to now maximize the expectations over I and R using those expected uh, weights, those Pareto weights. So what, what's the sort of economic idea behind this, because behind this very simple observation? 
the idea is that uh, the designer is going to assess or, or, or forecast the true need of the agent as expressed by this unobserved social welfare weight by estimating it based on things she can either directly observe, which is the label, or she can elicit in the mechanism, which is willingness to pay. Okay? And as a consequence, the optimal allocation will crucially depend on the statistical correlation. That's what Daniel already pointed out between those unobserved weights, this, this true need of the agent, and the observable things or elicitable uh, things, uh, the INR, okay? And I, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples just to kind of see why this is uh, natural to think about. Uh, the obvious point is that labels could reveal something about those welfare weights. So suppose we care more about poor agents, for example, and suppose we have uh, access to some sort of income data. Maybe you know, you know, you have access to tax returns. So you know the income bracket where this agent is. And so you can think of I and J as capturing two different income brackets, right? And then it's very natural to say that if I corresponds to a lower income bracket than, than label J, then the average weight um, on agents with that label is higher than the, the average weight on, on um, agents with a label associated with higher income bracket, okay? Um, I'm gonna call agents with the same label a group. So you might attach a higher uh, weight to a group that's associated with a label that reveals something about their need, okay? And, and there are other possibilities, lots of them, right? So it could, those labels could capture family status. We often give priority to, like, to families, ethnicity, educational background, the neighborhood you live in, et cetera, right? So these are very commonly used in social you know, public programs and so on. A more subtle point is why willingness to pay would reveal something about those underlying uh, welfare weights. And that's what Daniel uh, hinted at, okay? So I'm gonna consider one example, which is extreme, but I think illustrates the point well. Suppose we don't have any labels. So we have two completely anonymous individuals, A and B. We just know they have cancer and they need uh, a cancer treatment. And we ask them, suppose it's elicited truthfully, what's your willingness to pay for this cancer treatment? And suppose agent A says $50,000 and agent B says $1,000. Now we cannot make any statement for sure, but it seems very reasonable to at least conjecture or, or in expectations say that agent A seems to be wealthier or richer or in some sense more in a, in a better situation because it's sort of unlikely that agent B would just not have a high need for this cancer treatment, okay? And, I, and so that's why it, it kind of, it seems to us that in many cases, it's natural to assume that there's a negative correlation between willingness to pay and this welfare weight, okay? If basically fixing other things your willingness to pay increases with your wealth, then it's sort of natural to conjecture that in a society where we care more about the poor, this uh, lambda IR will be a decreasing function of R. What if you add labels back? Suppose we actually know that these two individuals have the same income. We have a label that tells us they have exactly the same income. I would say that we would still expect this residual correlation. So notice in the previous case, we kind of, there was kind of an omitted variable. And so this omitted variable caused uh, cause us to sort of attribute some of that uh, um, effect to, to willingness to pay. Now we, we know that they have the same, the same income, but I would argue it's still probably, there's still some residual negative correlation because it, even if they have the same income, maybe they have different wealth or maybe agent A has a very wealthy family that can help out. So we could still think that B is in a more disadvantaged position and we should st still attach a higher weight to agent B, right? So even if you're conditional on those observables, there might still be residual negative correlation. And just to contrast this with an opposite extreme case, okay? Let's just change the good. Suppose we now ask for willingness to pay uh, for a concert ticket. And the agents give sort of similarly disparate answers. Agent S says $50, agent B says $0. Now in this case, I would argue, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about the, the need of these agents or their wealth, right? Because you might say in this case, well, maybe agent B just doesn't like this particular band that is playing, right? And, and in any case, these are relatively you know, affordable goods. So we would not expect uh, your wealth to matter that much. And so I would argue in this case, we would maybe think of Lambda as being roughly constant in willingness to pay. Okay. And so the point of this all is to say, there is some sort of economic content behind this, this Lambda IR. And from now on, I'm just gonna take this as a, as a fixed function. I'm not gonna talk about how it's derived, but you can sort of see how we think about it here in, in these examples. Maybe I'll, I'll take a quick pause here because this is sort of the, the, really the key slide. So, so I did wonder if, uh, if lambda was observable, then uh, given the correlation, I guess you have full extraction. So the problem becomes less, much less interesting. So it seems like a clever trick. 
the synth. Uh, right. So, I mean, there are two things I want to say. So, if if you basically also can elicit information about R, and if, if even R is observable, then it's trivial. If R is unobserved, but lambda is perfectly observed, the problem is still well behaved. And actually, this is allowed because the label I could just perfectly reveal the the um, the lambda. Why not? I mean, this is allowed, right? Except we assume that lambda is, uh, sorry, I is, comes from a finite set, but if there are only finitely many lambdas, then I could perfectly reveal it. And it's still a non-trivial problem to solve. Uh, although it, many of the effects we're gonna talk about are gonna be kind of mute. Is, is it going to be important that this is finite? So I understand this is somehow a vital for your analysis. Um, just the example, it could be a continuous thing, right? If it's wealth or uh, anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we could have a long discussion about what's more realistic, continuum or finite. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's somewhat important for our techniques that it's finite. I don't think it matters at all for the message and we could probably extend the techniques to handle continuum if it's really important. You'll see how it works in the, I, I'll talk about the algorithm. So you'll see where we use finiteness exactly. Thank you. Now, just a little bit about revenue. That's also something I emphasize. And so we want to think about revenue, not just as revenue for revenue's sake, but as actual source of redistribution. So we think of that budget that the uh, mechanism generates as a, a source of, of money that the designer can use for some sort of valuable cost. And now I, I, tell, I told you that when we assume non-negative transfers, it's a feature, not a bug, because we can now, using this alpha, capture a lot of uh, special cases of what the designer can do with the revenue, including giving people a lump sum payment. So if we set alpha, this weight on revenue, to be the maximum over labels of the average Pareto weights in these groups, then this is exactly as if the designer were just giving a lump sum payment to the group that's most deserving based on the observable information. So this is as if I spent the budget to basically just give lumps or give cash to the group that I can identify as the most deserving. We could also capture a case when alpha is equal to the average weight in the whole society. And then it's as if I could give lump sum payments, but only to everyone. I could not condition on the label, right? So this is another interesting case. Uh, when alpha is above the average priority weight in a group, it means that we want to take money out of the group and give it to someone else. So this is some sort of outside cause. Could be a different group of agents or could be something completely outside of the model. Maybe we want to build a, a highway or build a, a school or something. And maybe the most interesting case, and this is the only one where the constraint of non-negative transfers actually binds, is when alpha is less than the average Pareto weight. This basically means that lump sum payments to agents in group I are either just prohibited or costly. Okay, and this could be for political reasons. Maybe we don't want to just give cash to people based on their observables. Maybe it's there's sort of administration that's costly that is causing the value to be below this average Pareto weight, but it's a, a way for us to to consider cases when you cannot just give cash to people, okay? So this is how we think about revenue. And my final slide about the framework is about essential versus non-essential goods. Uh, so this is a, a simple observation, not a, this is definition, sorry, this is just a definition. Uh, so let GI be the CDF of willingness to pay a conditional label I, okay? And it has some density uh, supported on, on some interval. So we just call a good essential if willingness to pay is bounded away from zero, okay? And this is a technical definition. It just means that, you know, a vast majority of agents need that good. Uh, so it's something like housing for healthcare, okay? Uh, so so if, regardless of your taste, in some sense, you need this good. That's why your willingness to pay is bounded away from zero. Okay, this is a great point for me to uh, stop for some questions. Okay, great. I mean, I guess just yeah, as, a, yeah. as a modeling question, why does it end up, I mean, maybe you'll show us this, but why does it end up mattering that you assume bounded away from zero without kind of imposing any distance from zero or magnitude? Um, yeah, so you'll see how it matters for one result. It's true, like if RI, if this lower bound is very close to zero, then basically it's gonna, uh, maybe I'll come back to this when I present the result, if it's okay. Yeah. The, the, the magnitude of the result will depend on how far away you are from zero in some sense, if it helps. Okay. There is no discontinuity in, in that sense, but the qualitative feature, basically it will predict that the mechanism will use some sort of random allocation. And so you can think of that randomness going to zero as this lower bound converges to zero. Okay. 
Okay, so now in terms of the derivation, uh, I want to emphasize this is actually not the part where we contribute something new because these methods is we basically use generalized ironing, which have been used by other papers, has been used by other papers. But I still want to give you at least an idea of how we solve this. And, and there are a few minor extensions along the way. So I'm going to basically present an algorithm without explaining how exactly why it works, but just kind of to show you that this is a very tractable framework. Okay. Um, so first of all, we need two steps because we have observable and unobservable information. We first have to take the pool of objects and split them across the groups. Okay, because this is not a mechanism design problem. Everything is observed. So it's just a matter of splitting the object into, into, into those pools um, allocated to these uh, groups of agents with the same label. And then in the second step, uh, in every group, we allocate these objects. Now we have to screen based on willingness to pay. So now this is a standard uh, mechanism design problem, this within problem, within group. Uh, because we have linearity of payoffs, only expected quality will matter. We call it QIR. So this is the average quality of an agent with willingness to pay R in group I. And two basic definitions, which are, I think, very intuitive. We could imagine that there is assortative matching between um, willingness to pay and quality. This is basically the market allocation. That's what a market would do. If you have a high willingness to pay, you, you get a higher quality object in equilibrium here in, this, uh, in a mechanism with assortative matching. Just means that you know higher quality is associated with higher R. And then uh, the opposite of that is random matching, fully random matching, which we also can think of as a non-market allocation, uh, under which for some interval of, of agent types, they'll get the same uh, expected quality. So they get this, the same lottery over, over quality, and resulting in a constant average quality in some interval of types. Okay. And basically, we're going to show that the, the optimal mechanism within groups is going to be a combination of assortative matching and random matching. Okay, so here's the algorithm. Uh, and I'm gonna present this assuming there are four groups. So I, I got a question about finiteness. This is where we use finiteness. We need those finitely many groups to, to, to make this algorithm work. That's exactly where, how we use it. Here I just have four groups. I'm just gonna show you how, how this algorithm works. So first what we compute for every group is, is basically a nonlinear transformation of the objective function. The objective function of course depends on I because I influences the, the, the welfare weights and the distribution of willingness to pay. So for every group, there's a separate function. This is in the quantile space. So think of this as below Roberts basically applied to our objective function. It's just expressing the, the value function in the quantile space for every group. And it's some function, okay? I just drew some random shapes. The key uh, way to solve the within problem is we have to now find, we have to now concavify these functions, okay? So it's almost like Bayesian persuasion on Amon Maschler. Except what we really do is we're finding the uh, decreasing concave closure. So the only difference is that if this concave function is increasing at some point, we're going to make it constant, like here in group three. So it's a decreasing concave closure. And it's a simple operation because it's all a, these are all one-dimensional functions. We can just do that. And this actually already determines the optimal allocation within the groups. So when the function coincides with its concave closure, you do assortative matching. So in this group one, there is a concave function, so you do assortative matching for the entire group. In group two, we, we had a convex function, so concavification is going to be a line, and so whenever the concave closure is above the function, you're going to do random matching. Okay, so in this group, you just do random matching for the entire group. So you just provide the good for free, uh, completely at random. So it gets more interesting when you have more of these regions, right? So if there's a constant piece at the beginning that just corresponds to free disposal, meaning you're just going to dispose these objects, you're not going to allocate them. Then there is a little bit of an assortative matching because the function coincides with its concave closure. Then there is a random matching for these types. And then there is assortative matching on top. Okay. And finally, in group four, you can see that uh, I just wanted to illustrate one possibility that actually is important for our, one of our results is that the function could be concave, but there could be a jump at zero. And then that makes the function non-concave. And then you again have this random matching at the, at the bottom of the distribution of types and quality, and then there is assortative matching, okay? And that's all I want to say about the within problem, okay? It, it's very tractable, basically, and this is an algorithm to, to solve this problem. Now, how do you solve the across problem? So now we, we know what to do within the groups, but the question is, how do we split the pool of quality across these four groups? And now the, the kind of the beauty of this framework is that these are basically value functions that are very well behaved. There are no concave continuous functions, okay? And so basically we can use a greedy algorithm because the slope or the magnitude or the absolute value of the slopes is gonna be the marginal value of allocating the next quality to that group. And so this is gonna make this greedy algorithm work. So by greedy, I mean, we're gonna start from the lowest quality and 
even though quality is continuous, think of this as allocating the next object to a, a, a group of the highest marginal value. So we're gonna start at the bottom. We're gonna find the group starting from zero with the lowest slope. And this group has a zero slope. So it's gonna get the first pool of objects, okay? At this point, the slope is gonna start going down and it's gonna be the same slope as in group one. So for a while, we're now gonna be allocating uh, to groups one and three, okay? Because, but with this correct speed so that the slopes, the slopes still stay the same, okay? At this point, this group will have a constant slope here and this slope here will be decreasing. So the next pool of objects goes entirely to group three. So whenever you have a linear piece, they're just gonna get all the, the qualities, right? Because the, the slope is constant, the marginal value is constant. So they're gonna get all of these until it starts going down. Then we're gonna go back to group one and, and, and one group three will get the object. So this, this continues until these two slopes are gonna be equalized to the slope in, slope in group four, right? You kind of, you get the picture. I'm going through this fast, but I hope this is intuitive. You know, we just always allocate the next one to the, uh, to the group of the highest slope. So because this is a constant slope, they're gonna get all the objects and we're gonna continue with these groups until we equalize with group two. Group two has a constant slope overall. So they're all gonna get uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the quality sort of the, the come next. And only after we exhaust group two, we go back to group one, two, three, and four. And here the highest slope at one is for group three. So they're gonna, sorry, they're gonna get the highest, highest quality objects. Okay. So that's basically the idea. I know I haven't explained why this works and so on, but hopefully you can at least uh, get a flavor of, of how this works. And it's quite tractable, which is nice. Okay, I'm gonna stop here again and then uh, get to the last and most important part, which are the economic implications. Okay, very good. So some results about this framework. Um, what we can get out of this. And basically what, what I'm gonna focus on today is um, circumstances under which you want to do non-market mechanisms. And it's not because it's more important, but it's because it, it receives much less emphasis, of course, in, in economics. Like we know lots of cases when we wanna do a market mechanism. So I wanna focus more on the predictions about non-market mechanisms. So here's the first result that predicts that we want to do some sort of in-kind transfer, which is gonna be a random allocation at a, at a price of zero to some of the agents. Suppose we have a group of agents, I, uh, think of a group that you know, is associated with some sort of preferential treatment that we wanna to redistribute to potentially, that has a higher average Pareto weight, this bar lambda I, than the weight on revenue. And moreover, suppose that the good is essential, okay? Then you, in fact, are going to provide the good for free, of course, randomly, because then you cannot screen, to some types in that group, some of the sort of types at the bottom, so the, the ones with the lowest willingness to pay. So what are the two conditions? Well, first of all, the average Pareto weight higher than the weight on, on, on um, revenue. It means that first of all, this is a group you care about. Uh, so maybe it's uh, poorer people, maybe it's people with lower income. This is what I is probably in this example. And importantly, you cannot give them cash. That's what this inequality says. You cannot just give them cash. Maybe for, again, for political reasons or administrative reasons, you just cannot give them a lump sum payment directly or it's costly at least. That's the first assumption. The second that the good is essential, so it's housing, food, or healthcare, for example, okay? Um, then you wanna provide some of the goods for free. And I, I got this question about why uh, this matters, right? Uh, so you can, you can see here that as this uh, our lower bar goes to zero, potentially this threshold type uh, for which you implement the lottery would also go to zero. So there's no discontinuity, but basically the, whenever RI is above zero, you get this qualitative feature of using a little bit of random allocation at the bottom. Now, what's the intuition for this result? And there is a tempting intuition that's wrong. So when I emphasize this wrong intuition first, you could think, well, uh, you know, you care about these agents with low willingness to pay because they are maybe very poor. So you wanna give them the good for free, right? But that's actually incorrect uh, because notice that we've made no assumptions whatsoever about how the Pareto weight depends on R, on willingness to pay. The only assumption we've made is about the average weight in that group. So the intuition cannot rely on uh, the weight attached to particular willingness to pay agents. It could be even that these agents at the bottom get a zero weight. It's, it's compatible with this result. Only the average should feature and should appear in the intuition. So the correct intuition is this, that this is a group as a whole you want to redistribute to. That's what this first condition says, but you cannot give them cash. So what you can do instead 
is you can perturb the allocation at the bottom by making it, it random for free. And what this allows you to do is just lower prices for everyone above, for everyone in this group. Okay. And this trick only works. You can only deliver this reducement, this sort of reduction in, in prices to everyone if in fact the lowest willingness to pay agent has a positive willingness to pay. Otherwise, this doesn't work just from a mechanism design perspective. Okay. So that's what you do. You you just you perturb the allocation a little bit at the bottom, and this has a second order effect on welfare because there is some allocative inefficiency, but it's a second order loss. But there's a first order gain because you lower prices for everyone, and that's exactly what you want to do under this first assumption. Okay, that, that's the correct intuition for this result. And this is one case where you want to uh, use a non-market mechanism. When you see this label uh, associated with agents, you want to redistribute two, but you cannot give them a, a lump sum payment. Okay. And you can sort of push this reasoning to an extreme and find conditions under which a fully random allocation is in fact optimal. Um, I don't have much time, so I want to talk about this condition. I want to just emphasize one uh, consequence of this result, which is that it's actually a necessary condition for full randomization to be optimal in this framework, uh, that lump sum transfers are not feasible, that alpha is less than the average prior weight, which we think is kind of an interesting conclusion that if you could give a lump sum payment to some group of agents, it would never be optimal, never, uh, to have fully random allocation. So it's not going to be optimal to just provide the good for free. Okay, you always would like, would like to have a little bit of price variation. Okay. And in fact, we can also predict uh, a little bit more when this, how we want to use those prices. Um, so now under the opposite uh, assumption that you care sufficiently about uh, revenue. Okay. And in fact, for this, we assume that product weights are not increasing in willingness to pay with this, with this argument uh, about coral negative correlation between willingness to pay and and welfare weights. And these two assumptions, you want to do assortative matching at the top of the distribution of willingness to pay. Okay, So maybe you, you could still do a little bit of random allocation for the lowest types, but you always want to do market prices for uh, for, the, for the guys at the, at the top, um, or at least assortative matching, I should say. And the intuition is quite simple because when this weight on revenue is relatively high, maybe because you can use the revenue to just redistribute as a lump sum payment, then this, this motive to maximize revenue will dominate for those high types under these two assumptions, right? Um, and so that's why you, uh, you might want to have a little bit of a price gradient at the top. And so the way we think about this result is, for example, if you're running a, a public housing program in a city, right? It's probably not a, the best idea to just provide this housing for free or at flat prices. What you should do instead, you should have some sort of worse quality uh, options provided for free or at constant prices, but then a little bit of price gradient for the higher quality so that you actually can gather some revenue and which then you can use redistributively, uh, maybe as lump sum payments or tax credit or something like this. Okay, so that's kind of an, an implied uh, consequence of this result. Okay, and you can ask, um, is this the only reason why we would want to use a random allocation? This, this case when we cannot give a lump sum payment. So this is what the next proposition will answer, okay? And we're gonna look at the sort of polar opposite case just to, to emphasize that this is now a distinct reason to use a non-market mechanism. So we're going to assume that you can give a lump sum payment to this group I, okay? So alpha, the weight on revenue is above the average prior to weight. And this is a non-essential good, okay? Just to make sure we, we, we switched off the previous uh, reason to use a non-market mechanism. Now, this is gonna give us a, and if and only if condition for actually assortative matching for a market mechanism, but whenever this condition fails because it's, it's an if and only if, it's gonna mean we, we will use some random allocation. So assortative matching is optimal if and only if the following function is non-decreasing, okay? And willingness to pay. What is this function? Well, this is basically a transformation of our objective function um, because we care about revenue. We have here this J, this is just the virtual surplus function. Okay, which appears in, in Meyerson. This is basically because we maximize revenue effectively with this weight alpha. So this is the first term. The second term is basically measuring information rents weighted by those Pareto weights. So H is just the inverse hazard rate. And you know, in mechanism design, inverse hazard rate is always a measure of information rents that, that a given type receives. And here, the only difference is that we have to properly weight uh, these information rents because we have welfare weights. And so they're going to be weighted by this capital lambda i, which is the average weight on all the types above a given r. So we don't use the little lambda or the type on, on r, but we use the expected weight on everyone above. And that's also very intuitive from a mechanism design perspective, because whenever you give rents to some type r, 
you have to give the same runs to all the types above just because of how IC constraints work in this problem. So this is why this is the correct uh, way to evaluate those gains by, by um, multiplying those information runs with those weights, uh, expected weights on types above a certain R. And so when this sum, this weighted sum is non-decreasing, you want to use uh, a market allocation. So what we're really interested in is the opposite, when this condition fails, okay? So we can just take the derivative, assuming everything is differentiable, and ask when this is not uh, non-decreasing. Uh, you know, alpha, the revenue is always gonna work in favor of doing uh, market allocation. This term typically will also work in favor of uh, market allocation. So we really wanna focus on this term, okay? This middle one. This is the inverse hazard rate, so that's always positive. So this will, so monotonicity will fail and we're gonna have a random allocation for some agents. If this function lambda IR is sufficiently fast decreasing in R, okay? And that's exactly the case when there's strong and negative correlation between the unobserved welfare weights and willingness to pay, okay? That's exactly what it is. This says that those weights have to be decreasing fast in R, meaning there's this negative correlation between um, the welfare weight and willingness to pay. When this is the case, we're going to want to deviate from a purely uh, market allocation and have some random uh, matching for some types uh, for which this, this, this gradient is, is, is very negative. Okay. How much? Okay, I only have four minutes left. So I will skip one result, which is about across allocations. So notice I haven't talked a lot about the, the allocation across the groups. And here's one result about that. Maybe we can come back to the, in the discussion. Uh, but but I, I do want to leave enough time for conclusions. And I'll stop here for just a minute. Uh, I'm going to stop anyway in three minutes, but if there's a quick question, I can take it now. Okay, It's probably best if I conclude and then uh, take questions. Okay, so just to summarize, when do we want to use in-kind redistribution? So basically a, a random allocation of, of quality below a market clearing prices. We basically identify two reasons, which are separate reasons. Roughly, it, it, mis, it must be that there, there is something that uncovers this inequality in the welfare weights, okay? Uh, and so what could it be? It could be label, the observable information. We call this label revealed inequality, right? So if there is a, basically a group of agents you can identify based on observables that have a high weight on average, higher than the weight on revenue, and it's an essential good, then you want to uh, provide some of the goods for free to the lowest of willingness to pay agents, okay? And so you know, food stamps could be su such an example where basically this label I is just eligibility criteria. If you satisfy, you can get some object for free, basically. Um, public housing might be another example of, of a label revealed inequality because you typically have to, again, satisfy some verifiable criteria to be eligible for public housing assistance. But notice that our result about uh, revenue means that probably you, you do wanna have this price gradient at the top of the distribution, even if you want to. Uh, think of this redistributively, uh, you might still want to use prices to some extent. And of course, th this is this is the case in, in, in many cities, for example, there is some price gradient. And then there's a second distinct reason uh, for using a non-market mechanism, which is when the inequality is revealed by the willingness to pay. Okay, so It's not the label, not the observables, but just the willingness to pay. When there is strong negative correlation between willingness to pay uh, and the welfare ways, then you also might want to use um, uh, kind of a prices below uh, below market clearing prices and, and some sort of random allocation. This is maybe a far-fetched, uh, but I think of sort of healthcare in Europe being provided in the public system almost for free in many countries as kind of, a, a, as kind of uh, an example of that, because you might think of this coexistence of a private and public market as basically screening, right? If you're relatively wealthy, maybe you want to go to a higher quality private system. So the fact that you use the public health system in many countries, for example, in Poland, I would say, where I come from, it's kind of already evidence that you are relatively poor or, or less advantaged. And that's, that's why it kind of makes sense to provide the service uh, at reduced or, or almost zero prices. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is reasons to use market mechanisms because we kind of know this as economists. Uh, revenue maximization is a motive to in, in favor of market mechanisms and the higher the weight on revenue, the more you wanna do this market mechanism and of course efficiency. Uh, we still care about allocative efficiency. so. If there is not a lot of inequality in those welfare weights, of course, in this framework, you also want to do efficiency maximization, which means using a market mechanism. Okay, I'm out of time. So instead of concluding, I just want to say one final uh, comment, which is that you know, in, in mechanism design, we have a ton of papers, thousands of papers about maximizing revenue and maximizing efficiency. 
uh, in, in you know, a variety of different settings under different assumptions, both technical and non-technical extensions. And there is just much, much less work in mechanism design and market design on redistribution. And so our main hope with these projects is to kind of draw the attention of this community to working on those redistribution problems. And, and of course, we leave a, a, lot, you know, a host of problems on the table. Uh, and, and there are lots of problems with our framework as well, right? The linearity assumptions are way too strong. We would love to uh, relax them. We haven't considered exposed furnace, uh, which is very important. So, you know, we use those lotteries, which means that sometimes people are going to end up having exposed low utility. That's not ideal. We probably should tackle this also directly. And we still don't understand much, at least we ourselves, uh, but hopefully also this is, well, it's probably also true about uh, our profession in general. We don't really understand um, how this redistribution through markets interacts with more conventional redistributive tools like income taxation. Okay, we, at least we ourselves have no clue how to think about this problem formally. Okay, thanks a lot. I should stop, I'm out of time. Okay, so it says that uh, Daniel, if you want, you can maybe keep going with your discussion. Thanks so much. So uh, I just go very quickly through some slides. Um, and so it leaves uh, space for people to also ask additional questions. Um, hopefully you can, you can see uh, what I've got there. So just flashing up the objective of the uh, planner here. Remember, it was to uh, maximize the uh, alpha weight on the revenue and, and also this, uh, the weight on, on the Pareto weights where lambda i was the, this expected uh, Pareto weight where there was no way to screen the R, uh, that there was no way to, switch, to screen the, the, the lambda, the Pareto weight, but uh, we, uh, rather we can think of taking expectations given the revealed uh, willingness to pay. And uh, so this is a clever modeling trick uh, because I mean, it, it seems, it seems uh, that this is a very natural way to think that the, that the Pareto weights are really hidden. Um, and transfers have to be non-negative, which plays an important role. So, so one thing I wanted to emphasize was just that why this problem is difficult is because the, the ironing uh, comes out. And, and so why should we expect ironing? And that was touched on uh, already. But, Basically, when alpha, well, one way to think of the easiest case to think is when alpha is small, so that revenue matters a lot in the objective, then uh, we have this difficulty of perhaps transferring rents, say, to high valuations, which, uh, but payments to agents are not permitted. So it seems that high rents for high types requires large allocations for the lowest type, and that comes from, through the usual integral formula for uh, payoffs uh, that, 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 that we, we know are familiar from the envelope type result. And uh, this is going, so, so when, you, when you then try to uh, inc increase the payoffs of the higher types, this is going to push towards the planning quality, which leads to a violation of IC. So that's, so that's why we need to control for uh, uh, the monotonicity here. And this, this, you can compare, for instance, to Condorelli, where alpha is equal to zero, and uh, he finds that there's no, uh, there's no screening uh, of types is just uh, allocation independent of willingness to pay, and that's intimately related to the the, the ironing uh, feature. So, the uh, other consideration that he touched on, he sort of sort of said, was the wrong intuition. Uh, but it seems like it, it should still play some sort of a role. That low willingness to pay may be associated with high, higher welfare weights, and therefore uh, efficiency considerations may call for higher qualities for the lower willingness to pay, given that transfers to agents are not. Uh, possible. So that these sorts of transfers in kind, we saw giving away the good free to the lower types was useful. And it, it seems like that is another reason why maybe lower quality, lower types, lower willingness to pay would be get higher qualities. But perhaps, uh, the, perhaps uh, it's just that this also somehow contributes, but it's not apparent that it, it comes through by itself as an effect. Um, so in terms of the major findings, uh, the, we find, I mean, they, they find that random allocation can be optimal especially when the revenue weights are small, we have good allocated for free, the lower, lowest willingness to pay, we have characterization of the allocation across groups and, and, and a rich, it's a really a rich setting, for instance, compared to Condorelli, we, we, we are, it's a very rich setting in which we can think about the usual revenue maximization motives here as well when alpha is large, and for instance, exclusion of the lower types. 
Uh, and so this is really a rich problem that can cons consider many, many different aspects. Um, the relevance of the approach, as, he's, as he pointed out at the be beginning, um, you know, there's uh, many, many pr problems in society where we address these kinds of, of questions. Um, and, you know, the low willingness to pay is often thought of as the most needy. And it seems that somehow ironing is then in inherent to these economic problems. And often when we talk about ironing, it's sort of a, a necessary evil to solve some problem. But here it seems that the non lack of monotonicity is really inherent in the problems. And so when, when we see uh, a, a lack of, um, when we see rationed allocation or free allocation, we may be used to thinking of this as economists as some kind of mistake from bureaucracy, that the lack of uh, thinking about the, the market mechanism or way, way to do it. But it can, this, these results confirm that this is not just a historical anomaly, but it in fact depends on the features of the problem that, that lead to uh, non-market allocation. Uh, and the other, the other point which he, he didn't mention but mentions in the paper is that uh, consideration of different observable groups also helps us to think about affirmative action since the welfare weights may be higher for some groups than, than for others. Um, so the last comments I have is just that, as, as he already pointed out at the end, as Peter already pointed out, uh, this quasi-linearity of preferences and money, which is a strong assumption we might want to think about risk aversion, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, Agent ranks agents across different groups rank quality in the same way. In fact, the, the social preferences, the the lambda weights are are uh, fixed and they don't depend on allocations. Uh, so you can imagine a healthcare setting, for instance, the allocation of who's been treated might affect the welfare weight of who's most needy. And so, so they're, they're, this is something that could be endogenous. Uh, and also, uh, you know, different. Uh, the, one, one other assumption is that the groups are discrete, and I think Nora pointed out this on, on this before that the groups are discrete and they're perfectly observed. But you can imagine that the groups, in, in, in practice, in reality, a difficulty would be identifying the different groups, and so learning about which who's in, in the different groups would be so there might be more continuity across uh, agents in that sense. Um, so those those are all my comments. Um, thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think if there is no other questions. We have plenty of time, so. Could I just respond very quickly to Daniel's comments? I mean, I just have one comment. I mean, I agree with everything 100% what Daniel said. I do want to just clarify one thing, uh, which is that when I emphasize that it's the wrong intuition to think about uh, high welfare weight on agents with low willingness to pay, it was just for this one result where I tried to uh, convince you that basically the label itself could just reveal enough information to justify um, a random allocation. But for the second result, when the willingness to pay reveals inequality, there's this is actually the, the absolutely correct intuition that when we associate uh, a very high welfare weight with agents with very low willingness to pay, that could well justify a uh, random allocation to these agents. I just wanted to make this point that these are two distinct forces, which is why I emphasize this wrong intuition. But the, the intuition actually is correct for the second result. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much with this. OK, thanks. Thanks. Got it. If I could raise uh, one uh, good example, I think anyway, would be electricity markets because it's a designed market. And so the, you know, the market really is built uh, and it's built to, for task, uh, it has to work. And uh, supply and demand balance is absolutely essential. So you have to use market mechanisms, but at the same time, there's the potential for enormous redistribution. And you see this uh, in you know, pretty much everywhere. Uh, but today, Texas is an emergency. Uh, the price is $9,000 per megawatt hour. Normally, it's 25. So it's more than a factor of 300 times higher than normal. And, that's gonna ha and it's going to extend for multiple days because of the freeze. Um, and so the redistribution consequences are uh, large. And, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's one example. And then in California, um, the, there's huge redistribution with respect to the way fixed costs are allocated. And again, this is a design choice uh, that the politics have done very poor job. And it would be nice to actually bring this technology to bear on these extremely important uh, questions about the allocation of an essential good. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this comment. It's, uh, we actually, I have to confess, we haven't thought of electricity markets before. So it's a great suggestion. We should probably look at them. And as you can see, uh, this paper is at a very high level still. 
So even though I said we concentrate on policy, so kind of giving some recommendations to policymakers, it's still a very high level. We definitely need to work much more uh, on specific markets. That's why we work on vaccines, for example, because it was pointed out we need some specific features for that. And I'm sure for electricity markets as well, we would want to incorporate some additional features, but it's, it's a great suggestion. We should look at that. Thanks. Okay, let me make an announcement uh, just before we keep going. Uh, in two weeks, we will have uh, Barak Patak with us from MIT, who will talk about effect of school transportation in Boston and New York, so matching paper, probably. So, of course, we will be happy to see all of you. Um, perhaps I can ask a question since nobody seems to... Um... Sure, please, go, go ahead. Um, so I, I, I have to admit, I don't remember the, the literature all that well, but I, I think Condorelli, um, you know, the, in those papers, there's also this idea that if you, um, so besides money, there's another resource that people could use, which is allocated perhaps in a slightly more uh, equal way, which is time. Um, I, I wonder whether you have thought about um, whether it's there are mechanisms where there are maybe um, people can take uh, welfare losses by doing things that take time just to show willingness to pay or something like that. I think there is some of that in Condorelli's papers, but I, I don't remember the details. Great question. So th there is a simple answer. I'll talk about our paper and about Condorelli's papers. So in our paper, if you set alpha to zero, that's exactly what you get. The weight of revenue is zero. It means that people are paying with something uh, which you value at zero as a designer. So the perfect interpretation of this economically is it's waiting in line, right? So then the, the revenue is just the total amount of time people spend in line. And of course you don't like that. You could even have a negative alpha maybe, uh, right? So, and we, we have results basically about that. So, so in particular, when we required that the weight, um, uh, you know, on, on revenue is small enough, of course, alpha equals zero is gonna deliver that as well, right? So we have sort of directly results about that. And we talk about this particular case a little bit more in the paper. We can kind of extend some of the previous results because we have those welfare weights. So people looked at the, this case when people basically pay by standing in line or burning utility, but I'm not aware of any paper that looks at Pareto weights. So we can kind of contribute a bit to this literature. Now what Condorelli's papers, Kashka has two papers from I think the same year. So it's pretty amazing. And there are two, I actually talked about the other paper. I talked about the one about market versus non-market mechanisms where he works with a transferable utility framework. He has another paper using similar techniques that just, just talks just about the, the money burning case, okay? So, and, and one of them actually uh, in, the, in the money burning paper actually does allow for heterogeneity and quality. Uh, so Daniel has, a, has some really great work on, on these topics and uh, yeah, and, and, and we learned a lot from these papers. And I, I, maybe I'll just add one more comment, a quick afterthought, that one thing that's that's still missing and that we're actually gonna be working on hopefully soon as the, maybe the next project is thinking about if you still want to use something like standing in line, even when prices are available and you can use them. So that's kind of a, something we're also thinking about. What if you can both uh, screen by making people wait in lines and by paying money, right? Which is something that we can see in practice, you know, um, in many cases. How do you think about those two at the same time? This is, however, I want to emphasize this is like the next step of step of difficulty in terms of analysis because you truly need a multidimensional screening problem uh, to model this, and we know that these are really really intractable from a mechanism perspective. But we're trying to take a, uh, take a look at that and, and see if we can say something. Uh, by the way, for vaccine allocation, we would love to be able to combine those two things because it seems a very uh, important feature to be able to talk optimally about combining things like waiting in line with monetary payments. Could I still ask a question? Of course. Mm, so I missed this, but, but can you also have the lowest willingness to pay people actually having a negative willingness to pay? And, and the positive yeah. welfare weight, like if I'm, a, if I'm a drug addict, say, and somehow you think I should get a, a treatment, is, is that feasible? That, yeah, that's, well? a, that's a wonderful question. And we do talk about this in the vaccine paper that's hopefully mm -hmm. will be written yeah. very soon. For vaccines, you really want this because there are some people that are just skeptics, right? Yeah, exactly. Actually, you would have to pay them to get vaccinated, exactly. but there is still exactly. a, a huge potential social benefit. Precisely. And so, yes, we talk about this. And basically, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the answer is basically that, yes, sometimes you might want to pay them. But mm -hmm. the caveat is that if you pay these people, you have to pay everyone mm -hmm. right? okay. because they are at the bottom of the distribution. So if you want to suppose that the most negative willingness to pay is $100, 
it sometimes is going to be optimal yeah. uh, to vaccinate even that person with a minus hundred dollar willingness to pay, but then you have to basically sure. pay a hundred dollars to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And so then it sense. all depends on like this uh, this trade off between revenue maximization or your budget, if you have some sort of budget, and how much you care about um, those people with the lowest um, mm -hmm. willingness to pay. In the vaccine paper, what really matters is the externality. And so to give mm -hmm. you like a high level intuition of what happens in that paper. Here, you use the willingness to pay to estimate the welfare weight. In the vaccine paper, um, you're going to use the willingness to pay to estimate the welfare weight and the externality. That's mm. kind of the key idea of the other paper. You kind of try to guess the externality that this person imposes on the rest of society by looking at their willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. And so you have a similar intuition that when this thing is decreasing in willingness to pay, those, those benefits, then you want to do a random allocation for free or here even at, at, by paying people. And the intuition could be, why could this be decreasing? You could think if someone is a skeptic and doesn't want to get uh, vaccinated, maybe they also uh, you know, decide to take less social distancing or maybe they are less careful when they interact with people. Maybe there's this correlation, perhaps. Uh, and then this might actually justify uh, doing uh, this sort of random allocation at almost negative prices, right? So, so the question there is, do you think that people with high willingness to pay will provide a higher benefit to society when they are vaccinated or people with low willingness to pay? And it all depends on, on these correlations between things that you can observe and things that are unobservable, like what, how people behave when they interact with each other, which you don't directly observe. Thanks. We really should, uh, my co-authors are here, we should really finish the vaccine paper because it, it would be much nicer if I could actually point to a paper that's online, but unfortunately we're still a, a little bit away from that. Okay, well, luckily in the US, we still have half a day to work on the paper. So we'll, we'll go do that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually Scott and I are meeting later this afternoon to work on that. So hopefully this was a really good boost for that. <laughs> do, do you have a sense of working on some of these, these que uh, remaining questions about, for instance, uh, dropping quasi-linearity or endogenizing welfare weights? Do you think this is something that's that's next generation of papers can look at or is it is it too difficult in terms of tractability right so we haven't we haven't really uh tried very hard but just like you say because it's just very difficult right so here we're still on very familiar territory right with this paper uh we kind of we had very good tools to use uh when things get nonlinear, uh there are some papers of course some important papers on these topics but things are much less tractable and we haven't tried yet I think w w our experience with this agenda is that there are lots of really good questions that are unanswered. And so somehow attacking those big technical challenges hasn't been a priority yet, but I think we're getting closer to having to try. Because for example, with this queuing idea, combining queuing with monetary transfers, we really have to take some steps into sort of uncharted territory instead of techniques. And so we're gonna try to do that, I think soon, hopefully. I mean, we're going to try soon, which doesn't mean that we're going to succeed soon. Maybe we'll succeed never. I don't know. These are hard problems, as everyone knows, right? Right. Yeah, that was, yeah, exactly the question. Thanks. Okay, if there is no additional questions, comments, or discussion, we are going to close the seminar. Uh, thanks to all for participating. Thanks, Scott and uh, Mohamed, for animating the chat. That was great. Uh, we can provide you the log of the chat if you want. If it's that'll be great, yeah. And uh, of course, thanks Daniel for the discussion and thanks Pierre for for the talk. Thank you. Uh, for all of you on the other side of the ocean, have a good day and a good lunch. For some of you, I think uh, good breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> for the others, <laughs> it's a bit later, so. <laughs> Today is uh, it's getting uh, darker and darker. So thanks a lot for all of you and uh, hopefully see you in two weeks and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks so much. <laughs>